But it's my great pleasure, my absolute great pleasure to welcome Dorothy Berry. Uh, Dorothy is the digital curator at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. She's a, a specialist in the description and discovery of African American cultural heritage, with an experience leading projects at major public and private institutions in the United States, and has been has become a, a highly called upon speaker. We're so glad to have her today, as well as a writer around the themes of marginalized people's histories in unexpected collections. Her work has been published in Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society, Uproot, The Public Domain Review, and Lappens Quarterly. It's with great pleasure that I'd like to invite Dorothy onto our screens for our inaugural uh, talk within Inclusive Collections and Inclusive, li inclusive Libraries event. Welcome, Dorothy. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Great. Thank you all for coming. I am so glad to be in conversation with everyone this morning, especially with colleagues that I've never met from across the world. So um, I had a little intro planned, but I feel like I've been introed enough. So I'll move on to a little introduction of the presentation itself. I'm going to present two case studies of different projects dealing with discovery and access of African-American cultural heritage materials. I um, wanna say at the outset that uh, any sorts of case studies like this are by their nature related to the unique holdings of an institution. And so perhaps some of the specifics of these two case studies will not be applicable to the work or the collections that you have at your institution. But I think that there should be techniques themes um, or possibilities that can be drawn out that would be uh, relevant across collections and especially to um, not necessarily collections focusing on the African diaspora, but perhaps on other marginalized groups as well. So the first uh, case study I'm calling Describing and Discovering Blackface in Special Collections. So this is perhaps a little different than what we often think about when we talk about EDI work and decolonial work in GLAM sector, but racially inflammatory materials are often a pretty large proponent, uh, not proponent, but percentage of collections, especially in institutions that have been collecting for a long time. Uh, descriptive conversations and special collections are often focused on updating the vocabularies and inherited descriptions which may be on totally innocuous collections, but some collections are inflammatory regardless of language and require um, extra thought when we think about access. So I'm gonna talk about a particular project background as it relates to uh, the work at Houghton Library. And I'll say that both of the case studies have to do with my work at the previous institution, um, Houghton Library, because I really wanted to focus on things that are applicable to folks in libraries and archives, and because I've only been at the museum for three months, so I don't really have enough here to give you a good case study yet. So I'll talk about the project background, about um, developing the research guide at Houghton, then how we implemented it at Houghton Library at Harvard University, and then a separate implementation of the guidelines at Brown University, and then some project takeaways. With a blackface minstrelsy material, the questions from users, regardless of their interest, is often, why do you have this? What's the market for this? Why does this still exist? Blackface minstrelsy is a performance form that was the most popular entertainment form in the United States and in much of Western Europe. Um, I can't say for all of Western Europe, but I know for Scotland and England, percentages were also incredibly high for popularity um, in the 19th through mid 20th century. Um, but it is also an art form or a performance form that today is so obviously um, offensive because it's a form that's based on uh, performing the idea of uh, racial stereotypes that to contemporary users, it is generally uh, sort of an immediate visceral response that is negative, which is fairly appropriate, but is difficult if we're trying to provide research materials. And especially as we expand our demographics of users, perhaps traditionally, I know Houghton Library has a huge theater collection and it had a very large minstrelsy collection and traditionally the researcher demographics were a very certain type of white uh, male theater scholar who was uh, perhaps used to or had particular views on these materials, but then as the demographics expand, we get different questions that sort of had been able to be avoided historically. 
I developed a individual project goal one year after seeing and hearing particular feedback that I received, um, not because I was uh, particularly involved in the theater collection, but from researchers who knew of my work with African American collections and wanted to have more of a personal conversation about their negative feelings about interacting with menstrual materials. So I developed this personal project, uh, individual project to identify our current collection and the descriptions, create localized recommendations, because it would need to be based on how our materials worked, and provide tools for future description. One of the things I often heard from colleagues was that, like I was saying earlier, this material was so viscerally um, upsetting that their reflex was to sort of get it out as soon as you can. And of course, everyone who works in libraries knows that we're also pushed with timelines anyways. So providing tools so that future um, catalogers and archivists would not need to do huge amounts of research in an area that might be uncomfortable for them if they just needed to quickly describe things in a way that both worked across our collections and was um, what we felt was appropriate to the collections. So to give some stats on what I'm talking about, in the initial inventory, there were 226 individual items with catalog records. So that single item manuscripts, uh, publications like books or playbill, not playbills, but um, scripts, periodicals, or archival collections that had their own catalog records. There were 3,172 items in the in archive space, which is the um, finding aid backend tool that we used. So that's posters, more publications, manuscripts and photographs, and 10 distinct archival collections relating to blackface minstrelsy, collections like further blackface minstrelsy. But again, making it difficult not only to see the mass of materials, but also from the user perspective, not really you know, just dealing with simple access, you would have to do a lot of research to find all of these materials because they're not co-located. And to continue on the co-location note, the top 10 subject headings were minstrel shows, minstrel music, popular music, and songsters. But there were no shared access points across those 226 catalog records themselves, with the most frequent heading only hitting 51 of the items. And so really not doing the job of subject headings even before getting into if these are the appropriate subject headings that we wanted to use. After identifying the materials in our diverse description and not uh, not in the EDI way, just in the having too many types of description for the same material, the recommendations were to focus on user experience and ease of discovery over library specific librarian specific domain knowledge. So that had to do with some of the vagaries of subject headings and analysis and sort of the um, ability for catalogers to select subject headings based on individual items and really wanting us to look at it holistically from the outset. We also wanted to focus on thematic co-location over format co-location. As I said, there were 10 archival collections and some of them were minstrel photographs or minstrel playbills, although there was also an omnibus minstrel collection that had photographs and playbills. So we wanted to um, really th focus on a user who is searching for material by theme, not by format, as that reflected our knowledge of our users. And then focus on description and surfacing African Americans over timely processing. Something else that came up as part of this project was that because our theater collection was so rich in minstrelsy materials and had been since the 19th century when it was a popular form, the theater curator was collecting new minstrel material, but while doing so was searching out unique material that focused early African American performers, because although this was a performance style that involved people performing and blackening their face with burnt Kirk cork to perform as African Americans, it was also one of the earliest formats in the United States where African Americans could perform even if they had to blacken their own faces to perform as black people. So we were getting these unique materials, but because they were being processed so quickly, um, and not with necessarily the communication to get that information over, we weren't even surfacing this diversity of this material. We were just saying, oh, we've got more blackface minstrelsy stuff than we did before, which is not necessarily the message or intent that we had. So at Houghton, we ended up with a new omnibus finding aid. 
So we had new acquisitions as accruals to our finding aid so that we would not be dependent on catalog or judgment for description or on the creation of a strict set of descriptive rules. This was something that was unique for us because it meant items that we would normally catalog as a single item, like a uh, published script uh, or playbook, were now just added to the playbook section, I mean, series of the finding aid. And that was um, sort of challenging for some folks to get their heads around, but focusing on our users and really thinking about the idea of what makes sense to librarians and archivists and what makes sense to people who do not work in our field. And then as for this Houghton implementation, what it required was a heavy lift in technical services. So merging these collections and maintaining the digital object links required a colleague of mine, Betts Cope, to develop a new processing plan and submit that to the curators and across the board so we could reorganize this material intellectually. We did not reorganize it physically on our shelves as those are closed stacks. And uh, this, if something has a space, there's no need to try to move it around because we, I think we all know about limited space and stacks. Um, but it did require a heavy technical services lift, uh, I would say maybe a week out of her time to really focus on this material. There was a separate implementation at John Hay Library at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island that went in a somewhat different direction. This implementation had a student focus. I was contacted by colleagues at Brown who had seen um, my publication of my recommendations, which I shared out because I had heard from many colleagues that this particular subject area was of difficulty for them. And they said that they had a student, an undergraduate student, who had written her uh, semester capstone project on their blackface minstrelsy materials and had a lot of questions that they didn't answer, they didn't know how to answer, but they wanted to provide the student an opportunity to work with librarians and with a graduate student to do some collections research and to reorganize how this material was made accessible. So they had a different context than we did. Uh, they have a very large sheet music collection as do a lot of universities and they digitize a lot of their sheet music. Um, but they also had a individual collection site that was um, specifically designed around this uh, blackface minstrelsy material. So this became not a heavy technical services lift really, but a summer semester project, which was the development of a new collection site that required uh, or provided a research opportunity for the undergraduate student um, and accurately described the collection and provided more historical content from a graduate student in musicology at the university and was a really great opportunity for student led scholarship. So they were part of a team of library staff and me as a consultant researching and providing contextual data to refresh the description and also to talk about the complications of working with this material as a group and as part of the intellectual journey, not necessarily just as part of the um, sort of back end work that students may not know about. So the project takeaways. Ooh, let me see for that. We really wanted to focus, especially with this challenging material, on description for discovery. So we had to challenge our colleagues to provide information that removed sort of the fig leaf of just saying, I don't know, um, and not necessarily taking the personal work to dig into the emotional reasonings behind I don't know, but really thinking about how can we challenge colleagues to take material seriously if it's material that we're choosing to steward. Um, which can be difficult because often the people that have to do cataloging or processing of collections are not the people that make the decisions about what we steward or collect. We wanted to focus on users and not on librarian centric knowledge. So bypassing internal descriptive standards to focus on discovery, using accurate language to describe the material because something that came up both on our technical lift at Houghton and on our student led lift at Brown was the idea of content warnings. And we had decided for this material Pardon me. for this material that the best way to describe it was with enough clarity that a content warning would seem unnecessary. So, for example, um, instead of saying this uh, collection may contain sensitive materials that may be upsetting due to racism or things like that, we chose to begin the description with a, defin a, def a definition of blackface minstrelsy that took away any sort of question about what was or was not in here. So something like blackface minstrelsy was a popular performing art style, which predominantly white performers painted their faces black and performed humor that was based around 
um, making fun of African Americans. If you can read that and you don't think that that's racist or that that might have sensitive material, then that is something that we cannot fix as archivists and librarians, but also that kind of choosing to be clear enough in our description that we did not need to, um, again, sort of assuage our own emotions by just putting warnings and then really trusting outside experts. So that goes back to this idea of more of what we did at Brown and also at Houghton. At Houghton, when I finished writing my initial descriptions, I sent them out to a couple of scholars I had been acquainted with and asked them if they had time, scholars of blackface minstrelsy and black performance, if they had time to quickly review these materials. I tried to reach out to scholars that I know had done research at Houghton, so it felt more like a um, feedback interview than just asking for their time because we all know nobody has time to do work for free. Uh, but luckily these scholars did and it really helped because it not only helped us with the accuracy of the information we provided, but also was good feedback because they are the users. So the second uh, case story I'm going to talk about is digitizing and discovering African American history in collections and I could have put in parentheses sort of perceived predominantly white collections, but that's much too long of a title. So um, we're talking about reviewing sort of ignored collections. So before we had the minstrelsy collection that we were all very, very aware of. And now we're going to talk more about this project at Houghton to ident identify and digitize African American history materials in a collection that was not perceived to have had African American history materials by our own acquisition staff. So collections discussions around EDI in special collections often focus on new acquisitions to make up for a history of not collecting and also sort of this idea that maybe new acquisitions will be more positive than sort of whatever negative history we had in the past. Uh, but there are often more diverse stories in our collections than stewards are aware of. So for this, I'm going to do a similar sort of um, organizational structure with the project background, how we planned it, the identification of our materials, how we made it accessible, and then some takeaways. Something I heard over and over at Houghton um, initially was that we just didn't have a lot of African American history materials because we had never really collected in that area alone. But we also never did a collection review, so it's difficult to say what you have or don't have when you don't take the time or are not able to take the time to do an actual collection survey with a very targeted focus, uh, knowing that materials may not have been described or have been perceived as fitting a dis particular story. So the project goals for this were to identify and create new access points for our materials, to digitize materials and create a collection site for them, and to provide tools for future description of these materials and discovery. So the takeaways from this, um, or the stats around this one, for completion were that we digitized over a thousand items, including entire archival collections, hundreds of bound pamphlets, books, manuscripts, and broadsides. We also cataloged over 200 uh, items that had been our collection for at least some of them 150 years, um, and primarily bound pamphlets that were purchased new in the mid 19th century and donated to the university. And then over four entire archival collections that had edited and updated language in their description that we did um, as part of this workflow, as opposed to some other workflows we have that have different structures. So kind of quicker um, editing on the go. To give a little, little breakdown of this over 2000 items, um, I broke down some of the formats. So we provided new access points for these materials by having the local team create a data set that broke down sort of formats and genres with a controlled vocabulary that was created by the team that is not necessarily tied to our cataloging site standards, but invited our librarians at Houghton that worked on this project to think like digital humanists and to think of our collection as sort of a data set that they could help define. So predominantly institutional papers, government papers, the papers of organizations, but also quite a lot of pamphlets, personal papers, broadsides, and publications, which we call, we covered most fiction and nonfiction bound published books. So for the project accomplishments, this took over a year during um, the height, well, I don't know how the stats work, but during the period of the pandemic where most of our colleagues were working from home, which is not necessarily the case now, but it provided us with a, hit, a proven example for reviewing our own hidden collections. 
So it really answered and turned on its head the perception that we hadn't collected the, in this area, especially since what we discovered with a lot of these bound pamphlets was that not only had they been collected at the time they were created, but they had been collected by some of our more um, prestigious Harvard alumni who at the time were abolitionists or at a minimum sort of liberal sympathizers towards the idea of um, African-American citizenship. It also provided, which I'll talk about a little bit more, examples for us to allow students to take interpretive roles, um, both giving students authority, which we felt very happy to do after the process that I'll explain in a little bit, and also allowing us to step away from the excuse that we didn't have any subject area expertise on staff, and also providing examples for public focused educational engagement, really challenging our library as a private institution to think about how creating access online means that we can open our materials up to different groups that maybe cannot access our library, either for practical or for um, more sort of intellectual emotional reasons. So to give those things a little more detail. With our colleagues working remotely. Um, Predominantly, we were able to design collaboration between on-site workers and remote workers to catalog these hundreds of materials sitting on shelves. I came back to work much earlier than many colleagues because of um, some of the projects that I managed and their responsiveness to remote scholars. And I took a lot of time to go through our materials, identify uncatalogued materials, and take photos on my phone of the title page and back of title page and last page and cover of pamphlets and set them up in an organizational structure on um, a shared drive that one of our catalogers who was working at home could then access and create um, sort of bare minimum stub records because a lot of these um, materials were already published. They were not necessarily the only known example of it. So we could have a copy cataloger really go through that work, which became a great project for her. And also sort of gave us an example of how we could expand our search for materials we had that needed to be cataloging without thinking that limited cataloger time needed to be spent for creating new records across the board. It also invited us, which is very difficult for a place like Harvard. I don't know what the equivalents are elsewhere, but you know, the, um, the most prestigious thinking of your institutions to know our own limits. We invited for the interpretive material on the website, student historians to um, create interpretive essays that would be illustrated by digitized materials from our collection on different uh, chronological eras, eras represented in the collections and then one student wrote uh, a little more thematically, but we created a professional competitive process for students to apply to write interpretive essays in collaboration with staff for um, a reasonable, but I think healthy uh, payment, but we mirror, we. Um, mirrored their writing process on uh, writing processes that people on staff uh, myself included had done for different types of. Um, digital storytelling medium. I think I mirrored quite closely the Adam Matthews um, essays format for when I have published for them. So the students could both have a professional sort of writing experience that allowed them to add to their CVs, but also we were able to pull both undergrads through postdoctoral students who had so much subject area expertise in different time periods that we just didn't have. And then also to be able to invite educational professionals to create a middle grade primary resource learning unit in collaboration with this local um, consultant to respond to regional needs. There are so many things we learned from working with that consultant that I hope will influence work moving forward about the educational system in the area surrounding Harvard and particularly the school system for children that are not in the most um, well resourced or supported schools, what they may or may not be learning at school, what are requirements for learning. So we can provide things that can help fill in those gaps publicly and for free so that teachers can potentially use those in their classrooms. There are a lot of project takeaways from this and a lot more that could be said about this project, but these are the ones that I think are most broad across the board. Again, going back to challenging colleagues, something that came in this project from the um, initial stages working with a project team at Houghton Library was focusing on education. I already had some experience and knowledge doing this type of work, but it was really important to me to decentralize that knowledge. So we 
also had ongoing discussions with that project team, recommended readings. We had a private uh, chat channel where they could talk to each other about decisions they were making in description or questions they had about materials. You know, articles were shared back and forth. And now I would say the colleagues that are there that did that work would both be fantastic because uh, one of them had left the position, but two of the colleagues that remained would be fantastic for reference on these materials, for identifying these materials that weren't part of this project uh, because of their focus and dedication. And those were my colleagues, uh, Micah Hoggart and Christine Jacobson. And then looking beyond our catalog, so imagining access for different users with different needs, the data set we, in, we developed internally, we also then put on the site for researchers who wanted to do more specific types of searching. So for example, that data set had uh, geographic note fields and specific date fields so that if a user wanted to sort of um, organize things by location, they could do so. So, you know, for example, the majority of the materials are for, were from the United States, but there were a good deal of abolitionist materials from um, England, Wales, and Scotland. And so if people only wanted to look at to those, they could find them and some of our more unique materials. So we wanted to sort of open that up to advanced researchers and at the same time include those sort of interpretive essays for researchers who maybe don't know what to do when presented with 2000 digital objects. We also wanted to try transparency. So something that came up a lot was the idea of like, well, we may have these materials, but we don't have as many materials that are written by African Americans. And that was true. The majority of the materials in this uh, collection are not the creative work of Black people, but they are part of Black history because they are pieces that contribute to the understanding, the political citizenship rights, the uh, you know arguments going around about Black people. So it's all part and parcel of this picture, but it was also important for us to be able to be transparent and to have a section on the site about why that is and the choices that our university made to have that be the case in the present. And then really, again, going back to what we said in the first one, again, trusting those outside experts. Uh, reaching out to the experts and letting them lead with authority, not sort of putting our vision, and that was especially true with the student writings. It was one of the questions they had because they were all very professional was what voice we wanted them to use. And having read their writing samples and saw that they all had very different styles, we wanted them to speak with their own voices. And part of the reason for that was a acknowledgement from the get go that we were not going to, nor was it really our job to provide a comprehensive understanding of black history throughout all time. Um, but also to let them shine as writers and hopefully to open up the possibility for future contributions in other areas that can have their own voices. So thank you all for um, attending and for listening. Um, if you need to, if you would like to reach out or if you need to, but if you want to reach out, you can email me at DorothyJudithBerry at gmail.com. And I look forward to hearing your questions and learning more. Thanks. Dorothy, thank you so much. I feel you should hear us all clapping in the background. You're going to have to imagine that kind of virtual applause. Uh, but it was lovely seeing the chat come through and also kind of healthy lot of questions to get us started. So I'd like to say just a thank you uh, to begin with, just for an absolutely fantastic start to this program. I mean, I absolutely love the kind of creativity and the expansiveness of your approach to getting the many voices, including those student historians, into the frame uh, to both challenge how we approach materials, but also broaden. And, uh, the voices we hear uh, and the perspectives um, that we would normally hear through, through um, existing cataloging techniques uh, and also the way in which you speak so openly about the the need to break down what may seem like an overwhelming task and it being overwhelming therefore we just never get started never do something and instead you've given us some practical tactical and also strategic kind of entry points to the conversation through those excellent uh, case studies and if you can see the chat you will see a myriad of hands coming together to say thank you for which which many uh, and indeed while you're talking a kind of can we make sure we can see this afterwards we want to carry on learning from what we're hearing so I'm going to um there'll be other questions that come in um I want to start with uh three question areas if I may I'm going to first explore a bit about use and impact of the work uh, uh in terms of kind of um the materials and the the um the the, the um the publishing of a greater quantity of descriptions uh, to provide entry points. Then going to explore a little bit about process. I think people are really interested in that kind of question as archivists, as, as curators, how do we break the task down? How do we get started? Uh, and then a little bit about strategies. So I'm going to come first, if I may, Dorothy, to a question from Patricia Dragon. Um, she's asked, um, have you noticed increased usage of the materials or have the collection owners noticed increased use of the materials since those uh, descriptions were enhanced? Um, and I think there might be kind of a couple of follow-up 
follow-up bits to that depending on where you want to take that Dorothy sure so what's interesting about the minstrelsy material is that it was high use already um so this was that one was sort of more of a thinking and this is harder for to test and of course I'm not there anymore but it would be even harder to do user research on but thinking about the experience of people that were doing that research because what I heard anecdotally from various researchers was that they needed to do this research because it was part of their you know academic process or part of what they needed for writing but it was still made them have negative feelings and I think that that was something that was very difficult to express, uh, perhaps to administration, this idea that people may access our materials and feel like we do a bad job at it, but still think also we did a good job at getting them those materials. And there's, to a certain extent, you know, you can't really account for people's feelings and side talk. And of course, you know, we're all allowed to talk about institutions and should and say Ugh, they could do better. But so part of the drive for me was this sort of thinking of, what are the things that we don't hear from people, but that we could do to improve their attitude around access and then going to Brown and hearing the student that was very backed that idea up for me because she uh, is an a undergrad so she would have been I don't know 18 or 19 she was an early student. And she didn't really know about this as a thing that was popular at all, so for her it was just like, why would we even have this what is going on here. And so to me, that sort of idea of just pushing that clarity through for someone like a student like that who might just see it and think, oh, well, of course, my university is old and racist, and I'm just going to keep going, kind of providing access that way or changing it. So I don't have any user research on that. For the um, digitized materials and that collection, we did get a lot more usage. Um, when I left, it was our most um, accessed digital collection page. And we got really positive feedback as well from um, both from scholars who were saying, you know, we're, I'm putting this in my syllabus, uh, especially for a lot of, uh, because we did high quality scans, a lot of things that maybe had been available in sort of the grayscale quick scanning, people were saying, great, I teach about this famous document, great, I can put it in my class now, or things like a um, couple of things we digitized more than one version of, so I did David Walker's Appeal, we had three editions, or um, the Gronesaw first black uh, slave narrative published in Britain, we had both an English language version and a Welsh language version. And so we digitized both of those. Again, thinking that is a very sort of specific idea of if someone's teaching this, maybe they want to put this in. But then we also got some from high school instructors who were saying, this is really accessible to me and there's no paywall. So I can tell my students to go access this. So those are of course more anecdotal than stats wise, but I do think we could say there was an increased use. They're, they're great examples and and um I think also you know we're all all looking aren't we for what is the impact of what we choose to digitize and and you know and, and how does that reach to audiences which are beyond the academy so actually they're fantastic to hear those examples and I wonder if I could just sort of um explore a little bit further that question of, of use um and its impact um on curriculum because it's such a kind of fascinating conversation uh, you know topic isn't it you know um how when we make when we release materials um that it can enter into kind of broader use are you seeing curriculum change happen around the ability to discover or is that the catalyst for actually doing the work in the first place i think for me it's more the catalyst mm -hmm. um because i was learning more about different professors at different universities doing this type of work on early black publishing and traveling around and doing all to find the materials to bring to their classes and knowing that we had the possibility to become a leading provider in that area, which didn't require us at that moment to necessarily buy anything new. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's that sort of strategy of presentation can be and combined with outreach can be as powerful as bringing in new things. Yeah, I thought that was brilliantly described around, it's It's very easy to, I'm just using a word that a colleague used on Friday at a simple research symposium, ghettoize our collections. This is Korean, this is Chinese, this is something else, you know, and actually looking for where those intersections are, which are always richer, deeper, and more varied than uh, perhaps 
in existing practices we kind of allow for and how we we reach things and um just on the kind of use as well then i'm going to move into processing sure. there's loads of questions uh, it's a question actually from david prosser who's um on the rluk team um and he's he's i mean it's a really really important question um you've hinted at the emotional toll that can be involved in cataloging and accessing uh challenging uh in this case racist inflammatory racist and racially inflammatory uh, materials do we as a sector from your experience provide sufficient emotional support uh, or um, space to that uh, emotional journey for those engaging in this work? I think that generally we don't. I think that support is difficult because it's not something people are really trained to have to do. I think space we could do more of, but also even I have been in scenarios where I've seen there be sort of an assumption that well, we are not almost allowed to have feelings about this. And not necessarily with the racist material, but I've seen that with um, material around sexuality and sexual violence or pornography. And, you know, sort of, well, of course you just have to process it. We're all adults here, but people have various lived experiences that could make different collections pretty upsetting. And if there's not a defined structure for being able to, I don't know, pass on a project or take more time on a project, it makes some people in a pretty vulnerable position to have to say I'm uncomfortable with this, which makes can make people feel like they're being unprofessional or like they're not, you know, doing their job properly. So I think space and acknowledgement are really important. And then, but yeah, I would say across the board, I think that we don't provide support and, and space for it. And perhaps because that's not a thing anybody gets trained on how to do. Yeah, it's interesting. We're going to talk about process in a minute, but we're actually talking about our own process, our emotional process, aren't we, as we kind of move yeah. through this. And I, I'd like to think this side of the pandemic, we, we are more human organisations, but we know we've got an awfully long way to go. Uh, but certainly, I don't think any of us think we can be successful leaders um, in the spaces that we run, unless we're providing a more um, humanised experience. And so I think that's a really, really great question from David and response from Dorothy uh, for all the people who are uh, can help to make this a better journey uh, on the call, uh, a great takeaway. Um, you, can I just again, just for the process, you, you mentioned that kind of question of kind of content warnings, some are called trigger warnings, also a hot topic, which seems to in the UK context kind of grab the press and, and excite them beyond yeah. any reasonable interest in the uh, the fundamental um, ethical academic questions that we're looking at. You sounded like you you were, I don't know whether recommended or just trying different approaches to that uh, through the I think that quality. for me and let I haven't seen them done very well a lot of the time. And so for this, many of the collections I've worked with, I have not leaned towards them, but I've also seen some implementations where I think they make a lot of sense and work well. So I tend to say I'm, a, I'm not in favor of them unless I, it's really audience serving. And I think that that requires more work than a lot of places put in. I saw that some colleagues at the Beinecke at Yale have a new um, thing they're coming out with about how they're doing it. It's probably I, knowing their work. It's probably very good, and maybe they'll change. Like you know, they might have some examples. Or thinking of colleagues like in New Zealand and things with certain ways of uh, presenting materials related to Aboriginal people that are responsive to um, belief systems and cultural norms. Those are also fantastic. I think a lot of times what I have been against is when I see warnings that feel like they are more about the emotions of the describer than the possibilities for the patron. So I've seen some that are like, this is so upsetting and offensive, <laughs> you know, to paraphrase. But that sort of thing, I feel like, well, I don't, I don't wanna tell someone that they need to be upset, but I do want them to know what they're getting into. And then you have the plain language, the description. Uh, here you are. You've got an entry point to to try and find out more uh, before you. And I think with sort it. of blackface, it's easier because we're all, yeah, you know, we're generally all in agreement. We don't like this anymore. There are other things though that I can imagine. Perhaps you do want to put a content warning for because you don't. We are there's not a shared value judgment. Amazing food for thought, Dorothy. Uh, and I kind of want to keep digging into some of that, particularly because I love that kind of bringing in the, the user experience and how that's shaping practice. And with that, I'm going to begin to come on to process. I've learned a new term in this. Um, my thanks to... Um, let uh, me just get him up. David um, Maggia from Princeton University, who introduced this term MPLP, which you probably know about, but, you know, was news to me. Uh, more product 
less process. Am I getting that yes. right? Thank you. Apparently in archivist terms, so I've learned something. And David asks, David asks, can you imagine scenarios for researchers where the focus on patrons, not librarians, might actually mean more work to create appropriate levels of discovery to enable their research? Can focus on patrons in some cases mean the opposite of more product, less process? Absolutely. So more product, less process as a um, as a tool to help us get through backlogs is very useful and makes sense in many ways and is not the same or is not useful um, to me for work that requires more detail. And I've had this back and forth with people that love MPLP and they will always say, well, it's not being implemented correctly if you're not doing detail work. So I think to me, What's difficult is that you end up sometimes with administrators who will say like, oh, do more of this detail work that is diverse and focuses on users. And at the same time, keep up the speed and uh, quantity of this more minimal processing. And those both cannot live together. I, yeah. That's the difficulty is that I think from the, you know, person in technical services, it feels like, what are you at? Like, I can't, I don't, don't tell this to people in charge of me because they'll just say, great, let's do it. And I'll still have to do these, you know, quotas. But um, yeah, I, by its nature, doing the work that is more responsive and that takes more research on our part will take more time. Yeah. Uh, which is not a reason for not doing it that way. Uh, yeah. Just really, really it's, it's part of the debate, isn't it? And I, and I actually, you know, picking up on that and kind of there's a few process questions to come to. Kind of one of the kind of uh, questions is around, um, you know, what have been the reactions? Because the, you're, you're, the moving kind of user focus is a shift perhaps from uh, curatorial choice. And I'm, you know, the question is really kind of what encounters have you had in that space? Has it just been an open door? Or has there been, you know, you're having to storytell, advocate, make the case as you go through? I would say I'm very strategic about these choices. <laughs> um, and there are some things that are hard for people to say they don't support regardless of how they feel about it due to the politics that we live under. Yeah. And I try to be strategic about those choices. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> so I mean, I think there are people who have felt that I spent too much time and attention was being spent on some of the things that I have pushed. And I, in my head, I think, well, I would love it if you would have come along board. <laughs> Well, I can but tell you. I also don't need you. <laughs> from the questions and the comments, you've got lots of advocates here and, and loads of takeaways. I'm going to dig a little bit on some of those process questions. Um, a question from uh, Rebecca Slatcher uh, What methods do you use for searching a catalogue, I guess if there is a catalogue, for hidden materials, especially if they do not have cataloging standards attached to so systematic searching or other? Sure. So, what I tend to do, and I think I detailed this more in a thing called in a, a case study I wrote for this project called Design for Diversity, Design, I think, for Diversity. So that was at Northeastern. If there's more detail, somebody wants to really dig into that. But what I tend to do is create um, sort of a bag of search terms on my own based on what I know of what I'm searching. So for something like these hidden materials that we were looking for for the digitizing, the big digitization project, I had a list of historical terms used for Black people both offensive and just outdated. Because I tried to think what might be in the title and what might be in a short description, like you're saying, like the question is asking, assuming no subject headings, assuming no other info. So things like that, um, terms that we know are of popular use, like abolition, uh, manumission, all these sorts of things like that. And then from the records I'm finding, learning new terms and adding them to the end of the list. And then at the same point for that, you know, there did come a point where I did the thing of very so finding a bunch of things in one call number range and then seeing that entire call number range. You know, um, like not as much as uh, probably lots of places in uh, England and Scotland and Wales and the rest of the UK, but Harvard is a pretty old, old university for America. Um, and so a lot of times the call number ranges and things like that were never created at the library I worked at. They were created at a different library 100 years ago. So it was not as, you know, some of it did take that practical work, but I like to sort of come up with that strategy and the same for the minstrelsy, come up with a list of terms that I know are part of that genre or that topic, search those through and then see what else you're finding. Mm 
I mean, in many ways, this is how we teach our students, isn't it? You've got to yeah. think laterally. You, you you know, the contemporary terms are not necessarily going to want to be fine. So you've got to be imaginative, creative and read through some of the subject backgrounds, get a, yeah. get a sense of what is contemporary at the time uh, that people are using. So, um, but, um, you know, it, it also, also means that that serendipity discovery, uh, uncomfortable things, next one, uncomfortable things kind of come to the fore. There's quite a few questions in this kind of area. So I'm, getting, I'm guessing that some of them will have picked up from what Dorothy's just said, some angles on that. But there's one from Alice Cleaver, which is um, at a slight angle. So let's see if that prompts anything different. Um, Alice says, we're thinking of doing an audit of our collection to determine representation of authors of color. Do you have any advice about how to approach that kind of audit uh, activity with a new lens on a, an existing collection? So I did a little bit of that, not at a full scale um, for, but I started small. And of course I had the narrow focus on African-American authors, which did get a little extended to other diasporic. But what I did for that was call on the work of experts, like I keep saying, coined ex outside experts, and look at other projects that had existed around um, bibliography of early Black American writing. Um, there's a project at Kansas University called the Black Books Project, and I think they trace every novel published by a Black person in the U.S. forever. And you're really just going through those names because there's on the one hand, there are famous people that it's like, at least let us know what things we have of the people someone would obviously come and ask. And then there were secondary where it ended up for me in, in this situation saying, well, we've got some pretty rare ones that none of us have heard of, but maybe we should start bragging on these. <laughs> maybe these are interesting rare materials that we don't even know. But now I'm seeing earliest black something something sci-fi novel or something. <laughs> Great. And it just was there. I'm guessing, um, I mean, I've, we're very aware that in the US, uh, the large consortia across universities, which are often kind of creating uh, kind of shared wealth of collections and shared discovery, are some of these kind of thematic ways of looking at material happening across institutions? Because you could get such a fantastic data set from yeah, mine. I don't know of it happening web. at big scale because it's just so much work. I don't know who has... Um, who's doing that right now. I know that Yale is hiring and Rutgers. Yale and Rutgers have a collaboration with this faculty project called the Black Bibliography Project. And they're currently hiring special, well, actually, I love this. They're hiring an archivist who is a permanent employee, but that the first three years will be project on this. So the amazing thing of not hiring a contract person, but just having a project be the beginning of their permanent job. But so they may be looking into that, but I don't know of other work that's really at that scale. And or, or and also to be fair, it could be happening in a subject area that I'm not as familiar with. Yeah, well, it's also a reminder of how much work there is ahead of us um, yeah. across the piece. Because this was also the work I did was only at Houghton. Harvard has huge other collections <laughs> Indeed. That I didn't even get to touch. <laughs> well, you shared a tremendous amount with us. I mean, we, we're just going to dig into to a few more. Um, a couple of, um, Erica, I hope you, you feel the, your question about African-American primary sources has partly been picked up by Dorothy um, already. So a couple of questions on, um, are there any publications that go into further um, further detail about work from process that might be recommended. This is asking specifically about the second case study. I think it's more broadly, people are asking for, where do I look to get further information and guidance uh, that I can share with my teams? I will say, I don't necessarily know. I'm gonna say look up Dorothy Berry in all your publications. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, that's, that's, if anything, that's a, more about like, I don't know, my laziness than knowing something else. That was my own work. Although I will say now that I've said that, my colleague, um, what is her last name? First name is Sophia. <laughs> but um, at LSU, Louisiana State University, has a piece called um, Anti-Racist Digitization Selection Criteria. And that's about the work they did at their university um, to select material for digital projects ongoing and how they added um, sort of a weighing factor that had to do with um, diversifying what they digitized, which is something that I also mirrored based on that work of sort of um, not saying this is the only reason we might digitize something, but having these weighing factors. And I didn't just do race, I sort of opened it up, but allowing whoever submitted to sort of provide a justification. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Because I mean, you, have, you have to make choices when you're spending yeah. your results. And sometimes it's just so. preservation is key, or this is a very important topic that everybody's researching this year. It's an anniversary and it has nothing to do with anything. You know, it's just still important, but the weighing. I'm going to come in with just a couple of final questions. I know we, we're really uh, 
pushing you for all the information we can get, but that's just the kind of excitement that your, your talk has generated. Um, there's one about, um, well, thanking you, um, um, uh, Rizitsa Atanosovova, uh, thanking you for the great case studies. Um, I'm asking whether there's been, what kind of training staff who participate in the project, she's particularly referencing the Horton, Horton project, I guess, you know, any training that has gone in um, to help make this a good experience for people. So one thing, Yes, so for the project that was the Blackface Minstrelsy, I did predominantly on my own on the research end, and then my colleague, Betts Cope, who did the technical work because she is an amazing processing archivist, I could never do what she does. Uh, we worked very closely together, and she had previously worked on this material before there was any sort of descriptive review. And so she was on board to that she was both sort of inured to the material in a certain way, but also very aware of its shortcomings. Um, and so that was positive. We didn't really need a lot extra on that. And then for the slavery abolition project with the digitization, that we had um, readings. And then it was during, like height of, like I said, height of pandemic sort of awareness, at least. And I realized that actually everyone was much too overwhelmed with just life and work to do readings. So I stopped, we stopped having to have assigned readings because I just didn't want everyone to feel like they were suffering. But then sort of shared more video interviews or relevant material and I think that because I had selected colleagues who I felt like at least were. Um, intellectually sympathetic to this work, they also would then sort of be coming in with I read this thing or even just I saw this thread on Twitter about some history aspect that's interesting to me and I did provide them some. Um, readings that were just in a shared folder of if you want to if this is helpful go ahead, but really with an awareness that this work can be very overwhelming for people. And it was a time when we were all at you know different heights of emotional um, states, and so I didn't want everyone to feel overwhelmed and upset. Yeah, yeah I absolutely understand that. Final question, really, is from Jeremy Floyd. Um, we're going to run out of time for the questions, so I'm going to do this one's the last one. He'd love to hear your thoughts on the types of projects and the relative benefits, I suppose, or interaction of types of projects undertaken with student temporary staff. Uh, I guess peer to peer kind of grassroots kind of bubbling up versus more structural systematic change in, in descriptive practice. And does one thing help or hinder or do, do they sort of all add to the overall uh, kind of benefit? I think that permanent staffing is best. And I think that this work needs to be integrated into your permanent staffing, like we were saying earlier with sort of minimal processing, which someone pointed out the good points that if it's not processed at all, then no one can access it. So that minimal processing, the other types of thing, the more complicated detail work, but I think that that needs to be integrated into ongoing work and it needs to be part of permanent staffing. We can't just bring people in and say, okay, we wanna look at queer collections. We'll hire one queer person, but only for a year. And that's not how any of us think of what we're doing, but that lends that leads to people having at the end of the day, you know, a very unsteady work lives. And so we're in, a, in many ways promoting that marginalization by continuing that. I think for students, one thing that we I mentioned a little bit, but it was very important to me that our student workers were paid and were treated as student workers because we were using their expertise and they had to submit, you know, resumes and writing samples to show that they could do this work. Um, so I think that there are benefits in having students and temporary workers, maybe, maybe, maybe grad students in library science or something. But my preference and my hope is that we would always be moving towards, you know, permanent jobs, unionized jobs, steady employment, and that this becomes part of everyday work not special, like every, all the things I mentioned were special projects that truly only happened because I was there and I said, I will do so much extra work because <laughs> this is important to me. And I have, I don't know, sometimes too many little mice in the wheels running around in my brain, um, but it should be regular work. That is part of the you know ongoing work. And maybe it's not all as exciting or great for public presentation, but could just be, this is our world. The same as we put a ton of time into processing certain collections, Let's say that this collection that is not as sparkly or comes with a donor agreement that gives us a little extra cash is also important because of the material and we're going to dedicate time to it as well. That is a fantastic point uh, to end and to thank you on. And I really do apologize to people. I know I've missed some questions in chat in the Q&A, but we only have so much time uh, that we could squeeze out of Dorothy for an incredible, and I do hope you get to see uh, the, some of the chats. It's really fantastic, Dorothy. I think that's a fantastic call to action to really ask us to be looking for the permanent jobs, the integration uh, into uh, into our establishments, how uh, this work becomes normalized, becomes regularized, uh, becomes familiar, and indeed how those skills that you described uh, stop being at the margins but are actually part of the core uh, activity and the core profile of who we are and what we do.